Welcome to Veterans in Transition, where we promote the veteran community. Each week, we travel around the region highlighting veteran-related news, issues, and events. In this episode, retired Colonel Karen Lloyd, Director of the Library of Congress Veteran History Project. Colonel Lloyd shares the collection of personal accounts of American veterans so future generations may better understand the realities of war and the personal stories of the veterans. General Larry Spencer has this interview. Good morning and thank you so much for being with us today. I I'm really honored uh, to be able to talk with you. Uh, you've got such a uh, storied career uh, and a storied life and an impressive career in, in life so far. So, and I'm sure there's much more to come. So first of all, thank you for your service uh, and thank you for everything you've done for our country. It's very much appreciated uh, and very, very, very impressive. Um, so let me start off by uh, asking you to just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, you ended up obviously in the Army, did very well. You didn't start off flying, but you, you, you flew later on. Tell us about yourself. What about your childhood that led you to the Army and, and gave you a passion to fly? Well, I'm a service brat. My dad was in the Army, Transportation Corps. Um, and uh, I was on, we were in Germany, stationed in Germany, and there's a um, big airfield right next to the golf course. And my dad had said, you know, if you, do any, if you don't do anything else, be self-sufficient. And that really has stuck with me all this time. He was a depression baby. Uh, he was Normandy, World War II. So uh, he saw hard times and, and really impressed upon all of my brothers and sisters the importance of being self-sufficient. Self I went to college. He said, you can go anywhere you want, but you better go. But if you want me to pay for it, you'll go in state. He said, don't think you're coming home. And that will galvanize someone. And it certainly galvanized me. And I looked around and said, what am I interested in doing? And I really wasn't certain. And the Army uh, gave me that path um, uh, to move forward. I got my private pilot's license uh, through the ROTC program uh, in college. I went to Indiana University. From there, I went to the Medical Service Corps uh, basic course. I came in at this amazing time when women were not, were being allowed to do lots of things besides being an administrative person or a nurse. And so I uh, went down to my basic course, I did well. And they said, wow, she's not dumb and she's got a private pilot's license. And, and so they said, would you like to uh, be a medevac pilot? I said, I'd love, that's why I signed up. I'd love to do that. And they said, well, you've got to go to a ground assignment first. So I went to Camp Casey, Korea, and they were introducing women into the divisions at that time. So brand new, didn't know what to make of us. I was fortunate. I had gone to jump school before I was assigned to Korea. I was, if not the only woman, one of the few women that actually had jump wings, which gave me a level of credibility with the folks that were there, which was very helpful. Um, I was with the division surgeon's office, got to ride my bike all through the DMZ, and people go, wow, wasn't that scary? And I said, well, actually, no, there's, there's so many guards and, and troops that it's really not scary at all. I felt very safe. Came back, went to flight school, was the first Medical Service Corps female aviator to pin on wings. Uh, didn't understand at the time what that meant. I just wanted to fit in. I learned that um, much, much later uh, in 2009 when the Army Aviation Association of America uh, was what recognizing women in aviation and they asked me to come to their convention to be, to, to, uh, be a part of that ceremony. Um, and that's when I finally realized, oh wow, maybe, maybe I, I did something. Was fortunate enough uh, to have a great career, 28 years, and then said, you know, I'm, not, I, I have to do something. I don't do nothing well, if you will. And uh, came to the Library of Congress, I worked in strategic planning, uh, worked for the chief of staff. And then in 2016, Dr. Hayden selected me uh, to be the director of the Veterans History Project. And I feel like I'm living the dream. Um, as the widow, as the child, as the sibling of veterans and a veteran myself, I feel like I've seen it from all angles. And and my goal is 
for us not to lose these stories? And how can we reach out to volunteers across the nation to talk to the veterans in their lives and their communities and gather these stories and gather these paper-based products, send them to us so that our world-class conservation preservation lab can make sure that they're available, not just for the families, but also for researchers and, and others that, that want to hear these amazing stories. I'm just curious, you mentioned something that uh, has always been uh, uh, problematic for me personally, and, and that is when, when I joined the Air Force, um, there, there had not been uh, a minority or woman uh, as a chief of staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I retired 44 years later, that still, was still the case. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, coincidentally, uh, the Air Force recently nominated uh, General C.Q. Brown, who's an African-American, to be the chief of staff of the Air Force. So if he's confirmed this summer, he will be the first. Um, and I was, you know, uh, I think General Dunwoody was the first female four star in the army. She, she actually got promoted a little, little, a little before I did. But the, not, n neither of the services to this day have had a, a woman as a chief of staff. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, why do you, I mean, clearly there's women that are qualified, that have the experience, that have the leadership. So it's not a matter of, of, of not having women out there who could do the job. Why do you think that is? What's the holdup? Part of the holdup is that people don't stay where they, they're not wanted. And I know I certainly experienced that. I'm just hard headed though. I hung around, I stuck around. Um, but I, I mean, when I was in flight school, um, I had my classmates that said, I won't be her stick mate because she doesn't belong here. She's taking a man's job. And my boss, my brigade commander, his daughter was in college, a senior, was in ROTC, and it was like he had an aha moment. You know, all of a sudden it affected him personally. So I got to see the difference between the guys in my flights class that didn't want me there, and they were, and they were able to say that openly. Uh, the best thing that happened to me was I had a Brit IP uh, during my uh, tactics phase, and, and he helped me regain the confidence in myself that I could do this, that I, I belonged, and, and keep moving forward. But I'm with you. I believe that women and minorities have all the capabilities and have had all the capabilities. It's just slow to come. I'm thrilled that Ann Dunwoody broke through that glass ceiling. That means there's going to be others behind her. I love that they've opened up all of the jobs to, to women. If you can do the job, you should be able to do the job. So I'm really thrilled that those changes have been made in the service. Uh, you know, I'm disappointed that it's taken so long. I mean, I've, I've been out 15 years and I, I still, it's creaking into the right direction, but it's not nearly as, as quickly as I certainly would hope. And it sounds to me like you feel that same way. I absolutely do. And I'm going to ask you a little bit of a self-serving question here, but my granddaughter is living with us right now. She's uh, four years old. Uh, a couple of things interesting about watching her. One is, you know, she's as rough and tough as anyone I have ever seen. I mean, it's un unbelievable. But I don't know why, and uh, we've never discussed it, but you ask her today, which I ask her all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? She says she wants to be an, air uh, uh, an airplane pilot. Good for her. I, I, where she got it from, she's always, you know, whenever we're outside, she sees an airplane, she looks up and she grabs and says, look, you know, a helicopter or an airplane, she's just fascinated by flight. Um, so what advice would you give to me that I can give to her um, to, to pursue that, that dream of hers and to become a, a pilot? Well, one, as you've already said, you can be anything you want to be, but I would ask you to think about going out to that local airfield. And, and showing her what that aviation history is all about, getting her to the Smithsonian and let her see what those aircraft are all about and, and doing those kinds of things. We actually have a segment on the Veterans History Project website that's women aviators. So you can go up there and see what these different women aviators have done, but I wouldn't limit it just to what the women have done. I would look all across the spectrum. We also have another segment on Tuskegee Airmen she needs to understand that it isn't going to be easy, that not everybody might want her there, but, but that shouldn't stop her. 
I mean, it's really all about being all you can be. And I would encourage you to give her the exposure and the opportunity to all things aviation, because it can be a variety of different things. And then if, as you've already said, don't limit yourself to one service. Every branch of service has aviation to include the Coast Guard. I mean, and they do some awfully amazing things as well. So I would simply say broad exposure to aviation um, and, and just reinforcing that she can be anything she wants to be if she tries and, and puts the effort in. Sure. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll, I will do that today. Okay. Um, by the way, as the uh, leader of the Veterans History product, uh, pro uh, Project, can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what is that? What does that involve? And uh, uh, just tell us how that works and, and what, what does that really mean? What does it do? Thank you so much for asking. The Veterans History Project is really volunteer-based, and we're asking that folks across, volunteers across the U.S. reach out to the veterans in their lives and their communities and listen, really listen, to hear about what they saw, did, heard, felt. They are part of history. And it's important that one, they understand, we recognize their selfless service and all that they did. And it's not just the oral interviews, it's also paper-based products. It's photographs, letters, diaries, memoirs. It's just a whole variety of two-dimensional artwork, a variety of things that show how the veterans spent their time in service, and it's in a variety of different ways. And so the Veterans History Project, in addition to having an amazing website, loc.gov forward slash vets, where you can look at the field kit and you can find out how to do it yourself and how to participate, it also has a um, database, a search, so you can look what's in our collection already. And one of the things we've done that I'm really pleased about is we have a thing called Experiencing War and its episodes. And it, it ranges all across the spectrum. Everything from Tuskegee Airmen to aviation to chaplains to medics. You know, think about a theme as it applies to the military. There's another one that is families in service. So we have uh, a father who was a Vietnam veteran and his son who was in Iraq. And uh, in this case, it's a gold star dad who um, in, uh, came as a part of the opportunity to interview and on behalf of his son and talk about his service. So uh, a lot of different things people can do. If you're interested in, in a workshop, we can do it virtually in this time of pandemic. In fact, we actually have already been doing workshops virtually with a variety of folks um, across, across the nation. And, and what we wanna do is say, do it safe, be safe, if you are in a facility uh, um, and it's, for example, the VA or the local nursing homes and you have a moment, we can do uh, interview, we can teach you how to do a workshop, teach you how to do interviews, and then you can interview that population and you're there already. We, or if you're with your family, with your, but we uh, do not uh, encourage uh, cross fertilization, if you will, right now. We, we really believe in that stay at home policy and the goodness that it's bringing to all of us. Oh, that, that's great. Now, um, you know, one of the things uh, uh, that I appreciate, because uh, I initially enlisted uh, in the Air Force before I got my degree, I have a real strong appreciation for the enlisted force. Um, and my, my own father was enlisted in, in, in the Korean War. He actually stayed in the Army for 20 years and retired. Um, but one of the things that uh, used to fascinate, about, fascinate me about talking to him and his buddies that were in the Army together, mm -hmm. and a lot of them served together in, in the Korean War, was the untold stories, uh, uh, you know, that, that because they were enlisted, they, their stories didn't come to, to the forefront. And these folks are heroes. And, and unfortunately, no, no one will ever know it. Uh, and the other interesting thing is they're okay with that. They, they don't really want to talk that much about it. And I, I noticed your project seems to focus on the enlisted force, which I really, which I really appreciate. Uh, is that by design? Uh, tell me about that. It's by design. I think of our collection as the people's collection. The bulk of our collection is really private through captain. And I'd suggest to you that's where the real stories happen. I mean, one of my favorites is Alice Dixon. She was with the 666, uh, 6668 postal unit. They were in Lyon, France. It was an all black uh, postal, all, all women, all black postal unit. And uh, she actually lived to be 106 years old. Wow. 
Um, just an amazing woman out of DC, uh, just a real pistol. And in her interview, what I love is she was in charge of packages. And so one came through and had liquor in it. And she said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? It had whiskey in it. <laughs> and so, so she went to her captain and she said, you know, I don't know what to do. I've got this, you know, bottle of whiskey and I can't send it forward. I don't know what to do. And her captain said, I'll leave it here. I'll take care of it. So that evening she goes back to the barracks and she says to her, her you know, her, her bunk mates, oh, man, I had a rough day. I had a bottle of whiskey. I had to go to the captain to find out what to do with it. And they said, well, what happened? She said, well, she said, leave it with here. Well, I'll take care of it. And they said, oh, you fool. We would have helped you take care of it too. But those are the stories that you just don't hear about. And it's so refreshing to hear those firsthand accounts from folks that would be otherwise lost to history. And that's really why I, I encourage volunteers to reach out and family members to reach out and get those stories. So in fact, they won't be lost. And we're backed up by a world-class conservation preservation lab. So they will be available. And that's why we insist upon originals. We want those original photographs, original letters, um, diaries, memoirs. I mean, we have some amazing diaries. For example, John Stavast, he was an Air Force pilot, world, Hanoi Hilton. He kept a diary, if you can imagine how dangerous that was. And in it, he kept track of who came in by aircraft type, because as you know, some aircraft are single, some are dual, and he wanted to know what happened to the other person. Hmm. Well, John McCain came in on the 26th of October. So in addition to having his collection and his amazing diary, we also have John, John McCain's. So these collections talk to each other. So it's really fun for me to watch the way these connections are being made, and the things, in this case, he learned French while he was uh, in the, it, it, you can see it in the diaries. So it, it's how is he keeping his mind busy? Um, so those are the types of things that, uh, that are in our collections that are amazing. Another one of mine that's really fun is uh, Jackie Jenkins. And you go, well, who's that? Well, she was a code girl. She was an ensign. She was in the Navy. She's Bill Nye, the science guy's mom. Hmm. And she was in Gosher College. And um, they came by and they, and they said, you know, are you good at puzzles? And are you, are, you, are, you, are you about to be married? And she said no to both, um, even though she was about to be engaged. And so she was working in DC on the codes, both the Enigma code and the purple, which was the Japanese code. And the work that she and her teammates did uh, made sure that, uh, well, helped us be successful at Midway because we were aware of what was gonna go on. I didn't realize that till we had them in last year at the first national code girl reunion. These women in their mid nineties were just amazing. And to know that they have really led the way for others to include myself uh, really made it special. But what's fun about that particular collection is that her husband, her, her fiance at the time was in a Chinese prisoner of war camp. So she's working and she's not telling anybody to include him what she's doing because she was told, just tell him you're a government secretary. So she wasn't really talking about what she was doing. And he, she writes him and says, every time I see the watch you gave me at Christmas, I think of you and, and how much I love you. And his letter back to her says, oh, Jackie, I love you so much. And I'm so worried about you. Now, remember, he's in a POW camp, you know, I have a group of people around me and we're all experiencing the same thing. You, on the other hand, are there alone without me and I worry about you. Can you imagine, you know, POW worrying about his girlfriend? Um, I just, what a lovely and romantic set of letters um, Bill Nye donated to us on behalf of his mother so that her story is not lost. I'll bet you have some amazing photographs and some amazing letters, not just for you, but for your dad. And I would ask you to consider coming down to the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress after this craziness is over so that we can not only give you a tour and show you what we're all about, but perhaps interview you. I would be happy to do that. Oh, uh, uh, you're on, we're on, that's great. Right. Well, that's great. Um, now you mentioned the craziness, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we're, we're doing this virtually because of that. 
Um, how are you dealing with that in terms of working from home, uh, continuing to work? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how are you, t you, you mentioned keeping your mind busy. H how are you handling the, the sort of, uh, I won't say new normal, we're not in new normal yet, but in sort of this period that we're in, a national emergency, how are you dealing with this? Well, I'm actually discovering that I'm busier than ever before. Um, the library has equipped all of my staff with laptop computers, so we're able to communicate um, on, a, on a rapid and ready time. I've done some uh, virtual interviews with others. Uh, we had the opportunity to do a virtual donation ceremony with a high school who's been working with us for the past 11 years up in Pennsylvania. And because they're on an AB class schedule, had an opportunity twice to spend time with the students about the work that they had done, um, reaching out to the veterans in their lives and their communities. Um, I find it difficult not to be able to see folks face to face. Um, my husband passed away, so it's me and, me and Otis, my dog, um, and he goes to daycare every morning, thank goodness. Uh, we had a couple, when they were closed down at the very beginning, and, and that was a real challenge, but I now realize how spoiled I am by having him go to daycare. But we're doing a, an awful lot of things virtually. Uh, we're actually hoping to have a PTSD virtual panel later this summer. It had been scheduled at the library. It's all about uh, veterans who are entrepreneurs and how they've used that to really work through their PSTD. We are not experts on PTSD, but what we're trying to do is reach out and find out and, and illuminate the different ways and the, and, and the help that's available to veterans so that they can deal with their own uh, PTSD and work with professionals um, in that regard as well. Yeah, speaking of PTSD, um, when I do come to visit you, one of the things I'll probably talk to you about is, you know, when my father was in the Korean War, Back then, well, there was no acronym uh, called PTSD, and even if there there had been one, they just didn't talk about it. I mean, you were just suspected to suck it up and don't complain and do your job. Uh, and that was, uh, and one day, you know, not long before my father passed away, I was visiting him, and he told me he had just come from a a group, uh, a support group, and I was like, you know, because that's very unusual for him. Okay. He said uh, he had gone in for PTSD. I said, what happened? I mean, is, are you okay? And he said, well, it's from the Korean War. Uh, and, and it dawned on me that he had carried that with him for, you know, 40, 50 years and, and just was afraid to admit that he still had some lingering issues there. And uh, I just thought that was so sad uh, that folks didn't seek out help. Do you find that folks are, are more readily uh, willing to seek out help, particularly when you consider the, um, the really horrific suicide rate with, within the military today? Do you, do you think we're making progress? I think we're making some progress. What I'm heartened by is there's, there's more organizations that are out there that are mindful that PTSD is, out, is, is, is ongoing. And I think what's not well known is that there are more Vietnam veterans that are committing suicide than there are the current conflict folks that are committing suicide. And what we're starting to see is that the Vietnam veterans are starting to tell their stories. And it, it is heartening to me because I know I didn't expect to tell my story and I did and donated it to the Library of Congress. And I felt the whole thing was for me cathartic. And I was so glad to have this opportunity. And while we're not in the mental health business, we have discovered that we hear lots of folks after the interview is finished, or we volunteers say to us, the veterans that they have interviewed say, that was amazing, that was cathartic, I'm so glad I did it, I feel better. For some, it can be that first step of just talking. And you don't always have to do it, I mean, while we prefer that you do it on camera, on audio, uh, to tell your story. Don't, you don't have to start the conversation that way. We certainly would encourage that you do. I happen to go out to the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering. Um, I've been going for the last three years and linked up with an, a veteran, uh, Navy. He was actually in um, Guam and he ran the little boat that went from the two sides of the island. 
and and he had an amazing experience and he wasn't in vietnam but it still affected him and he he had he was still dealing with it and so i interviewed him but he actually said after the interview was over i'm so glad i had a chance to do that but please do not, i do not want to donate my my story i completely understood the fact that we were able to be there and to help him was worth it and what an amazing story he had um so it's really about listening to those veterans and i believe they're hidden in plain sight as you said veterans and i suspect you're just like me don't walk around i'm a veteran ask me my story that is just not the way we operate we were part of a team and that's that's how we think of ourselves i know i said i don't think i have a story um and i had a good interviewer that teased it out of me and i remembered things during my interview that i hadn't thought of in 40 years talk about a little scary but um but it was a good time and i look forward to doing your interview i'm so excited so oh, great i'm glad to hear that that's all for this edition of veterans in transition we ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. If you have a story to tell, reach out to us at vetsintransition.com. Finally, this is no ordinary day. Flow in the spirit of your own life. Remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time.